like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Good morning, and welcome to the Fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The second Sunday of Advent, the advent of Christ, the birth of Christ within us. And just a few facts about Christmas before we go on to this next song. Is um, I just saw on the TV this morning, on Sunday morning, that 32 million Christmas trees are going to be sold this year, live ones. 17 million artificial ones. And probably they're estimating about half the country uses fake trees now. Half uses real. And then, you know, I, I have these divided feelings about it. My brother had a Christmas tree farm once, meaning he had a bunch of acreage on his house, and he said, well, I'll, I'll get a write-off here. He said, about 2,000 trees per acre is what you can plant, and you have to shear them and trim them to get them to be the right shape. And out of the 2,000, typically about 1,000 will survive. In the Northeast, about 750 will survive. It's, it's colder and harder. But, you know, it's kind of, oh. <laughs> and in the early second century, uh, the Christian fathers were denouncing, you know, Yuletide and all this sort of thing because all throughout the Roman Empire, people put Yule wreaths on their door to honor the emperor. So basically the message was, you know, those that burn Yuletides, they'll burn in hell. <laughs> and, of course, times change. <laughs> times change. And now let us softly say, our traditional invocation three times, softer and softer. There's only one presence and one power in the universe and in my life, God the good, omnipotence. There is only one presence and one power in the universe and in my life, God the good, omnipotence. There is only one presence and one power in the universe and in my life, God the good, omnipotence. And let's just sit in that divine silence for four or five minutes and we'll end with the Lord's Prayer. There's only one presence, one power. And deep within our hearts, we are one with that divine, luminous, illuminating, self-luminous presence of God. Deep within our hearts, the wholeness, the completeness, the birth of the Christ takes place. And it is our joy to nurture to develop, to mature this birth of Christ within us. That we might live in the image and the likeness of Jesus Christ. And let us pray as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as though we have those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, Alice. Good morning. I'm so glad you came. Good to be here. Yeah. yeah, really, I'm so happy everyone comes. You know, it just, it makes Christmas feel like happening as opposed to just sort of living separately and just doing our, our, our daily business, our daily, daily chores. But, you know, we talk about the birth of Christ, you know, we talk about Jesus as the Prince of Peace. I ran across this story 
that uh, tells about Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, you know, who, who wrote Sherlock Holmes, of course, and who was one of the great practical jokers of all time. I, I didn't know this. But at one point, uh, that, uh, he, the story is told that he told a sort of horrendous, although very clever practical joke. He took 12 of the most prominent men in England and sent them an anonymous telegraph. The same telegraph to each one. It said, all is discovered. Flee at once. <laughs> Within 24 hours, you couldn't find any of them. <laughs> So, you know, I, I think about the Prince of Peace and I think, these 12 men, of course, you know, they, the problem, I'm sure they live in the world of politics or, you know, they all had some dark secret they didn't want exposed. But just, just no peace living like that. Just no peace. And a, a lot of it is if we don't accept what's gone on in our past, we can't be at peace. The way Job found peace was he decided to accept what God had done to him. Then he found peace. And in that finding the peace, everything was restored. There's a, a beautiful psalm, Psalm 139, where David acknowledges, King David acknowledges that God knows everything about us anyway. You know, there's no reason to be ashamed. You know, and if God knows, what does it matter if anybody else knows? It's just, it can't matter. You know, what's what's important here? Who who are we putting up on the pedestal? The opinions of others or the opinion of God? And God already knows it all. So David sings, For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before you. Because God knows everything. Everything about us has been discovered. Flee at once. I encourage all of us to the refuge that Christ gives us. There's a, uh, another story, you all are familiar, of course, with the comic strip Peanuts. So there's one strip where Charles Schultz is you know, drawing the comic strip, or you know, in the comic strip, Lucy and, and uh, Charlie Brown are, are, are sort of arguing, and uh, she's chasing him. She has a score to settle, Charlie Brown, and she's chasing him, saying, I'll get you, Charlie Brown, I'll get you, of course. I'll knock your block off, Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown, who's been running full speed, stops and totally out of character, says, wait a minute, hold everything. We can't carry on like this. We have no right to act this way. The world is filled with problems. People hurting other people, people not understanding other people's problems. Now, if we as children can't solve what are relatively minor problems, how can we ever expect to? And then, of course, the next scene, Lucy just hauls off and slugs him. And she says, I had to hit him quick. He was starting to make sense. <laughs> But isn't that the way it is? You know, so many of us were, were, you know, harboring grudges, we're arguing, they shouldn't have done this. You know, we feel this chaos in our world and, and it's just, common sense says, this is nothing. This is absolutely nothing, you know, compared to what other people are experiencing or, you know, we're just reacting out of something from our past causing us to react this way. What is this about? Hmm? We're all children of God but we're acting like we're three-year-olds. Making it look good, but <laughs> still acting like three-year-olds. In Mark 6.47, it says, describing Jesus, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. Meaning the disciples were in a boat, already out, you know, and Jesus was on the shore. But when they saw him walking on the sea, as Jesus starts to walk on the water to join them. They thought it was a ghost and cried out. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Then he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astonished. You know, I always sort of took that as a uh, sort of a nice story. Okay? And I'm happy to accept stories like that as being true. But... The symbolism of it is phenomenal. You know, we are the disciples living in a world of chaos. The sea, the wind, the storm is all around us. And as long as Christ is over there on the opposite shore, that's our lives. 
The minute Christ comes and joins us, Christ in you, your hope of glory. You know, let this mind that was in Christ be the mind that is in you. When that Christ mind comes within us, peace, the Prince of Peace, is born within us. What does that look like? The Christ mind. Let the mind of Christ be the mind within you. I'll describe it differently in terms of an unoffendable heart because it's really a better picture even though you could call it a universal Christ mind or you could call it the love of God within your heart. Jesus tells us at one point in Matthew 24, you know, sort of leading up to days of, of trials and problems, then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And because inequity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And you know, we have a hardening of our hearts. Our hearts become cold rather than the natural state of being the center of love flowing out to our friends, our neighbors, to all creation. You know that feeling of being in love. That's what the heart is for. What we can experience at one period, at one time, at one moment, we can experience all the time. You know, some days we wake up, we just feel that love. It's there. We just need to cultivate it, bring it in. It says in Ezekiel, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. You know, that's the unoffendable heart. That's the Christ mind, where we think with our hearts instead of think with our human three-year-old mind that says, oh, you've done me wrong. You've hurt me. You shouldn't have behaved this way. And we just, with our heart, learn to accept and love what is and welcome in the very deep peace of Christ. Let me share a almost unbelievable true story. It's about the war between Honduras and El Salvador. Honduras and El Salvador, I mean, what do they have to fight about? You know, there are two little countries down there in Central America, and they actually get along pretty well with each other. I think it's Honduras has the better farmland, so the El Salvadorians tend to, uh, to go over there and uh, farm and go back and forth like that. And so a, a war erupted in 1969, and, and no one was quite sure what caused it. You know, they, they got all these political theories, but the sociologists went back and researched it. And what they found was it wasn't any great political decision that one country did to the other. It was a soccer match. <laughs> and just <laughs> grew and writes, you know, this and this and this, and suddenly, I mean, I doubt these two countries have much of an army. I know Costa Rica doesn't have an army. You know, what are they fighting with? <laughs> what are they fighting for? You know, changing the boundaries? You know, uh, but that's what causes so many people to be killed. We start reacting. You know, just, just reacting. Uh, we take offense. The little things in life, we take offense. And the thing is, nobody can really offend us. I mean, if you ever had a, a three, or had it happen, or maybe seen it, you know, a little two-year-old shouting to his mother, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. And the mother just blows it off. They don't take that seriously because she knows there's no reality to it. But when they grow up to be six feet tall and say something mean and nasty, we go, oh, I hate you. You know, you, you respond in the same way back. This is about the Prince of Peace being born in our hearts so that no matter how tall they are, we look at them as though they're three-year-olds. And our lives are the ones that change. We're the ones that are reborn in this process. What they say doesn't matter. We just accept and love. There's a place in the Bible most people have a very hard time understanding or, or almost even believing Jesus says, I come not to bring peace, but to bring a sword. So the proper, proper uh, translation of peace there is closer to the sense of complacency. 
So Jesus is saying, I come not to bring complacency, you know, but to bring a sword to destroy that which is old, that old wineskin that causes us to react out of our past rather than reacting from our unoffendable hearts within, our, within us. You can't have peace of mind if we just stay complacent where we are. We have to do a little bit of surgery. Let go of that which causes us to react rather than to proactively act with love. You know the prayer that we say at the end of every service? I just found out today that it was composed 63 years ago this day. You know, the, uh, the light of God surrounds us, the love of God enfolds us, the power of God protects us, the presence of God watches over us wherever we are, God is. It was composed by James Dillett Freeman, you know, the, the, the poet from the Unity Church, for the people in World War II who were out. He was looking for a prayer, you know, and basically that's what came up within him to you know, help those who were in, really in the battlefields. It's now been copied at least 17 million times, probably more than that. That's a, it's an old figure. And the prayer of protection was taken to the moon on the Apollo flights by uh, astronaut Buzz Aldrin. And that's really a peaceful prayer, that idea that God is protecting us. And in that protection, there's peace because we know in His hands we're whole, we're complete, we're safe for everything that's important. Peace is a, you know, it's really a state of being that we live in. We claim it. We own it. We become unoffendable, unflappable. Nothing, nothing touches us because we're anchored to God. You know, the early symbol of the Christian church was not the cross. It was the anchor. And on the, probably about the fourth century, when you look at tombstones of Christians, they have anchors carved on them. And then uh, and it just became... I guess theology just changes over time. I was thinking this morning, you know, Christmas trees and this, and and um, one of the things that, that happens to me, we're now on YouTube. You know, Jerry puts our, uh, not just puts his TV shows on on the local public access, but she's put them on YouTube. And so I'm getting now fundamentalists who are quoting me, you know, quotes, passages about the Antichrist. You know, they go, Cosmic power, you know, and then here's here's a passage about the Antichrist. Yeah. <laughs> and at first I was offended. I was like, <sighs> like how could he do this to me? You know. <laughs> but uh, there's something about not challenging people's sacred beliefs. You know, we don't want to be in that business. You know, we want to just mind our own business and go forward and let people offend us. And, I mean, I, I wrote back to the, the, the first fellow and, and said, you know, there's, Jesus gave us two main commandments. You know, love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And if, you know, if you feel that you're loving God by doing this, by all means continue. I mean, what else can you really say? But, you know, I was offended. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and I go, oh, what what a great gift that he gave me. God gave me. You know, if we we understand the world correctly, everyone we meet is just a messenger from God, just an angel in disguise, bringing us that which we need to transmute within ourselves to turn into the light of Christ. It's an atmosphere of peace, atmosphere of the heart. We really just connect to the presence of God. And in that pr connection, it overshadows the particular events of each day. But we have to take the first step. You know, we, we, uh, there's an inertia, uh, sort of a comfort zone within us where we feel comforted, where we feel safe. And we're afraid to border, you know, go beyond these borders. We're afraid to let people insult us, offend us, 
try and take things from us without responding. And I would just encourage everyone, the way of peace is to not react, but to see the hand of Christ in everything that happens. I ran into this fabulous story this past week. And I didn't read the book, but it's from this fellow that writes, I mean, his name's Hawkins, who uh, writes these books, Power and Force or Truth and Force. And what he does is, and I don't quite believe it totally, but it's such a great story. Is he, he does all this blind muscle testing on thousands of people. And he gives culturally or, you know, subtly what, what the vibration level is, you know, what's most evolved, what's most truthful. And since, of course, Christ comes out at a thousand. Buddha came out at a thousand. Um, most humans come out at 167, I think, is the average. <laughs> all, he, he, they muscle test all the predatory animals, and they're all under 200 in the scale. And all the peaceful animals are over 200. It's, it's very interesting, and it's blind testing. So it's, 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 it's very curious. Muhammad tested at 700. Okay, which is very, very high. Very, very high. Only they would write, you know, they write his name, put it in his envelope, and test it 700. Then they write Muhammad with a sword because there's a time when Muhammad felt he had to uh, physically go on a jihad, a, a, you know, a, a jihad of, of war. Although his main teaching was, after, after the battles, he would come back and say, now begins the real jihad, you know, the jihad of the heart, you know, the jihad of the spirit, where we, we fight the lower tendencies of the human. But when they tested him, his name with, you know, Muhammad with a sword, it came out, you know, under 200. Okay? Which is very interesting. And so the, the lesson out of this is, all of us at times pick up a sword. You know, whether it's, you know, mentally, just a, a mental denouncing of someone or whatever it is, we all pick it up. And it's we who are damaged. This is why Christ says, you know, turn the other cheek. He's not saying this to uh, teach you how to be a doormat. He's saying this because if you live like this, you'll be at peace. And you may not be the richest person in the world. You may not be. Or you might. You, I, you know, I'm not going to say one way or the other. But I know, you know, we were recently flying back from uh, Dublin and a group of Mennonite Amish were on the plane, all young ladies, very, very lovely ladies, you know, long skirts, very, very wholesome. You know, they just put out the perfect wholesome image, you know, with the white scarves over their hair. They, and that, they're not, they don't wear black. They wear blue and white, I guess, was what they're wearing. And I just, I just marveled at you know, these four or five gals five, six gals. They'd been over in Ireland on a, uh, a mission. They had an aunt who was a, a missionary in, in Ireland, Ireland. I didn't ask them. I, I wish I would have. If, the, you know, it was, it's not like a, a feed the poor type mission. It's a converting type mission. You know, go out and, and I thought, are they converting people to Christianity or to their way of life? And I don't know. It would be very interesting. I wish, I wish I would have asked. I mean, either way is fine. But I looked at them and I thought, you know, these gals were very peaceful. The whole, the wholeness really came through. And I kind of get to say, wow, there's something about this lifestyle that really generates you know, living a very simple, peaceful life. But we want to be imitating Christ, living as Christ did. In John 16, the Bible says, I've said this to you, so that you may have peace. He goes on to say, In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And that's why we might feel like we're in a hurricane. Our lives are spinning out of control at times. If we're in the eye of the hurricane, we're at total peace. That's where the heart of Christ is. Right there. And we just want to anchor. Anchor. Philippians, it says, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's this undefendable heart. The Bible tells us, this is Job, he says, Agree with God and be at peace. Agree with God and be at peace. That means 
whatever comes to us, we love, we give thanks for. You know, it looks like it's a disaster. I mean, this church is a perfect example. We were booted out of our last place. I went, oh, what is going on here? You know, it took me a little bit, but you know, I, you know, I was a little offended. <laughs> Just a little. It wasn't that bad, honestly. It's just, but it was there. It's like, you know, I just, what, what, why are they doing this to me? And, you know, I could have stayed there forever and never had a place like this. You know, I just would have never been motivated. And, and so many blessings are coming out of this on so many different levels. So, who can say? You all have heard that story. Who can say what's good or bad? I'll tell it another time. It's such a good story. But, uh, we want to agree with God and be at peace. Love what is. So there's a, a couple things about this. You know, there. the question always is, how do you do it? How easy is it? What, what's, the, what's the next step? And I'm reminded of the story that I heard from this, about this old uh, circuit rider riding around, you know, so about you know, 80 years ago, we probably had him in this area, riding around. <laughs> but um, one of these circuit riders was riding around one day, and uh, he sees a, a farmer working in his fields, and he shouts out to the farmer, Well, good morning, how are you? And uh, he's saying, Fine day, isn't it? The man gets up, you know, straightens out his back, sort of hurting a little bit, and says, Well, it's fine for you to say that it's a fine day, because all you do is ride around all day thinking about God. <laughs> and the preacher says to him, well, I'll tell you what. I do ride around, and I try and think about God all the time, but it's really hard work. And the farmer looks at him sort of askance, and the preacher says to him, I'll tell you what. If you can think about God and nothing but God for one minute, I'll give you this horse. The farmer goes, great, I'll do it. Sits down, starts thinking. After 30 seconds, he says, does that include the saddle? <laughs> so all I'll say is, in terms of going into the heart and this unoffendable heart, we just want to keep trying. Do it again and again and again. It's like I finally decided that trying to, to diet, you know, where I'm going to say no, no sweets, and no dairy and this sort of thing is, it's a bad idea. Now I say, low sweets, low dairy. <laughs> okay? Much better. And the same thing here. I'd say, we want to strive for low reactivity. All right? Give yourself some space. Give yourself some freedom to make a mistake and correct. We just correct. We just continue. There's a story in the Bible about Sarah a passage in the Bible describing her age. It says, Sarah was 100 year singular and 20 year singular and seven years plural. And it makes no sense that they would describe it this way. You know, it's just not the custom and it's bad grammar and there's no mistakes in the Bible. There's always a deeper symbology for any of them. One of, the, one of the truly great Kabbalists, you know, Isaac Luria, called the Ari. He died when he was like 32 or 33, and he totally you know, restored Kabbalism in about the 15th century. You know, he wrote all these, you know, actually gave all these teachings, and they, they wrote all these books about him. But what he says about this passage, because he, he would uncode all these passages, both in the Zohar and in, and in the, the Torah. And he said... 100 year and 20 year more or less refers to, I'll put this in modern language, to the fact that many people can have, you know, work at a job for 20 years, but they really have one year of experience. They do it the same thing over 20 times. Okay, they don't really grow in it. He said, what Sarah did in the last seven years of her life was so profound and eclipsed anything that she'd done in the earlier years. And that's why... Sarah became so revered. You know, there's this matriarch of, of Judaism. And it's the same way here. No matter how old we are right now, no matter what we've done, you know, all these years of, you know, 
how many years of practice have we had living reactively, like three-year-olds? You know, let's count up how many years we've been alive. So it doesn't matter. What matters is where we go from here. And that's the path to anchoring to the Prince, Prince of Peace. So I, I pray for everyone to have a very Merry Christmas season in this advent of Christ being born within us is very, very successful. Each and every one of us. So with that, let us... What do we do next? This, the money. <laughs> the money. Hey, it's okay. God, it says in the Bible, God loves a cheerful giver. I, joyful, hilarious is really the term. A hilarious giver. <laughs> It's always watered down to cheerful. <laughs> so let's take our gifts in our hands and in our bulletin we have a what's a uh, statement of truth that we give, a blessing. We give holding our gifts in our hands. And let's say it together. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I have all that I give and all that I receive. Almighty Father, for your divine grace we give thanks, for your generosity, for the softening of our hearts, for the love to be reborn within our hearts. We give thanks. We pray in your divine presence that you take hold of our hearts, remove any stones within us, and restore that divine heart of flesh that heart conceived in your divine image. In your holy name, amen. You know what I'd like to do is just spend a moment in prayer for those in need. Okay? So let's just close our eyes. Say, Almighty Father, we pray for those in need of abundance, of jobs, of homes, of housing, of vehicles at work. We pray for those in need of healing. Let's just take a moment, and each one of us silently or publicly, just within our own hearts, our reborn hearts, just hold the names of those in need of prosperity, need of healing, need of relationship work, in need of substance abuse, assistance. All those victims of physical abuse. We pray for you now. We see the light of God surrounding you. We hold you in our hearts, drawing us near. Drawing us both nearer to the very presence of Christ. And just for a moment, soften your hearts. Breathe into our hearts. And with that softening, know that Christ is coming into our hearts. The very divine presence of God. As we soften our hearts, God comes in. Let's draw again the names of those in need of healing. The names of those who may be alone this holiday season. We pray for you that you may find comfort and companionship. That you might feel near in your heart to those who love you. And again, breathe into your hearts. Soften. Bring in the light of Christ, that living divine presence that forgives everything, that washes away anything in our past that may cause us to fear, to be without peace. Just bring in that presence and wash away, wash away. 
put your attention down to your feet for a moment, to the soles of your feet, that we might connect to the earth, that we might walk with our feet firmly on the ground, stable and strong, while in our hearts we soar with the very presence of Christ. Father, for all your blessings, we give thanks. Amen.